Okay, welcome to uh, Chapter 9, Criminal Justice Today. Uh, this is the last of our chapters on the court system. Uh, we're going to be looking at punishment and sentencing uh, today. And uh, then we will transition over to looking more at the uh, penal system, uh, looking at the prisons and the jails and how those interplay with the entire criminal justice system. And we've got a unit on juvenile justice, kind of catch-all unit at the very end, and we're done. But for today, we're going to look at uh, punishment and sentencing. And as you all are pretty familiar, I'm sure, we will look at the learning objectives first here. Again, these are just uh, background uh, for both the lecture and these PowerPoints that you're going to be looking at. They're in order to give you an overview of what I'm hoping to discuss with you, uh, points I'm hoping to make. Uh, I think these are all very useful to keep in the back of your mind as you read through these chapters and listen to this um, lecture. So we'll move right on to some questions to ask before the beginning. Now these are not inside the text itself, but I think these are fair questions to ask um, anytime you're studying this area. And I think the first one, uh, which is it, it, at first seemingly a, a very simple question, raises some uh, very very fundamental points about the uh, entire exercise here. Why is it necessary to punish? When we instinctively, I think, after we catch someone who's done something wrong, we have them, um, the answer is, well, it's got to be punished. And the question is, why? Why is that necessary? Because that gets to what you're hoping to accomplish with the punishment, unless, of course, the punishment is the goal itself. The second fundamental question is, and it relates back to the first one I think that you have to answer when you're thinking about the punishment and sentencing is, what are you seeking to accomplish here? Um, what is effective? Are you trying to, is, is the punishment going to be the same, for example, between someone arrested who's 80 years old for shoplifting and someone who's 15? Is the punishment going to be the same for someone you you catch who has committed fraud to feed his family and someone who's committed fraud to buy drugs? The third question here is what alternatives there are to incarceration? And how do we decide to deviate from our standard punishment, which is incarceration, to these alternatives? And again, this last one goes back and reinforces the second point. Should everyone's punishment be the same? Are we seeking for a system of punishment which is exactly identical for each person? Or should it vary depending upon what crime they commit? I think most people would say yes there. Who the victim was? I think you'd get more disagreement if the victim matters or not. What the gender is of the offender or the victim um, or What's the age of the offender or the victim? All of these, I think, point us to directions to help us understand how we're thinking about these problems. Okay, so one of the uh, first things that I wanted to talk about was solitary confinement. And uh, this is a very long history in the United States. And in micro lecture 9.1, I'm gonna talk a good deal more about some of this history. Um, also about whether this needs to continue, and I think more as a way to think about the evolution of punishment and sentencing. So again, that's lecture 9.1. If you're interested, you can certainly um, access that here, and uh, I will um, seek to enlighten you and seek to be enlightened by you. Okay, so there are four possible reasons that we talk about when we talk about why we need to punish. And these four reasons are retribution, deterrence, incapacitation, and rehabilitation. Um, now, these are not mutually exclusive reasons. And again, anytime you see a listing of factors, there can be external factors beyond these four. But taking these as our core, retribution, um, this, I would say, is probably the oldest. This is, um, to use a... Old Testament biblical um, reference. This is an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. 
that going back all the way to Hindrabi's code, and we actually have codes older than Hindrabi's, but that's our, I would say, our most complete oldest code. Um, the idea that you were going to somehow balance the scale through retribution, deterrence, that you punish people because by punishment, you will prevent future crime. Now, there's two types of deterrence, general deterrence, you're seeking to prevent everybody from doing a crime in the future, and specific deterrence, you're seeking to prevent the person that you're currently dealing with from committing crimes in the future. Incapacitation, which is, well, we don't quite know what we're doing. We don't know whether we can accomplish deterrence or that retribution is right or that rehabilitation is possible, but we can incapacitate this person. We can remove them from the society, separate them physically from the community, and prevent any problem. The final one, um, probably the most contentious, and certainly one that we've, our points of view have changed about quite a bit in the last 50 years, is rehabilitation. Try to fix the broken person. Take the person who committed the crime, the wrongdoer, and eliminate their desire or the probability that they in the future will commit another crime. So somehow fix them, rehabilitation. All right, so I did say deterrence had two, and I, I went through this pretty quick, but I wanted to um, I wanted to be a little bit more specific when we talk about deterrence here. So I said there was two types of deterrence in sentencing and punishment, general deterrence and specific deterrence. So to give you a, a, a quick example, um, there's an old movie with Paul Newman that I'm sure most of you have never seen called Judge Roy Bean. And he plays a Judge Roy Bean, whose motto was law, the only law west of the Pecos. He was a Western judge. And they catch someone who has stolen a horse. And they bring him before Roy, Roy Bean, as I recall, who was Paul Newman. And he says, um, you got to get out of town. You got to get out of town before sunlight. And the guy says, well, I don't have a horse. And he goes, well, you better steal one. And you better steal a fast one because we hang horse thieves. And I always found that, that line very amusing. And if you think about that whole thing, um, if you think about hanging a horse thief, general deterrence is the idea that you're hanging a horse thief so that other people won't steal horses. Um, and other people have said this in less colorful ways. Specific deterrence means that that particular horse thief that you hung will never do it again. To, to give you, a, I guess, a more serious example, um, I've taught courses on serial killers, and one of the things I'm firmly convinced about is that you can't fix serial killers. And I'm also pretty convinced that if you ever let most serial killers out, they're going to kill again. The end result of which is the only way you can be sure that a serial killer will not repeat his crime, absolutely sure, is execution. Um, and I don't say that lightly, and I don't say that it's the only answer. Maybe it's worth life incarceration and the small risk that he might escape. But perfect specific deterrence there would be the execution, capital punishment, for a murderer who has shown a propensity to commit multiple murders in the past and a continuing series. Now, thinking about that example in general deterrence, general deterrence assumes that rational choice is the fundamental reason people commit crimes. And that certainly may be true for some people. You may say that to return to our example of capital punishment, by making the crime of murder punishable by death, that most people would look at it and say, wow, that's so serious. I'm not going to commit that crime because it's so dangerous. But there are some people, of course, that they're not going to think about the crime before they do it, or they seem to have no control over it. And that goes back to... Um, the serial killer there. I don't think by threatening a serial killer with future punishment, saying, you know, if we catch you, 
Uh, if you told uh, Andrea Ciccatillo, the uh, Rostov and the Don, the murderer, uh, if you told him we're going to catch you in the future, um, I don't think it stops them from killing. So somewhat ironically, specific deterrence is the only uh, way to punish a, a serial killer, but general deterrence has no effect on them. If you believe in general deterrence, then maximum publicity is critical, as is certainty of punishment. People have to know they're going to get caught and they're going to be punished. If your system doesn't catch most people or doesn't promote the idea that they get caught and punished, then you lack general deterrence. Um, now, I said that there was those four and I wanted to jump back and, and focus a little on specific deterrence, but I think there are other reasons why we punish. And here are just a couple, and, and I think if you think about it, you yourselves may come up with others or modifications of these, or the one, the big four that we talked about. One of the reasons you punish people is to support or maintain the current social order. That if you catch people that do things you don't like, uh, or that they want to do things they don't like, that punishment preserves the current system. So, uh, again, I'm not sure when you'll listen to these lectures. I'm recording them in June of 2020. And we're in about the 10th day of riots over the murder of um, Mr. Floyd, um, George Floyd, from Minneapolis. One of the reasons um, that the social order, the uh, difficulty with racism that we've had in this country has been maintained is the punishment of those individuals that seek or sought to break it. So you can see the criminal justice system as a basis to maintain the political power of those that hold it now or the social power that those hold it now. And this can be very overt like it was in Jim Crow's day, where there were literally laws that singled out minorities, primarily African Americans, uh, for disparaging treatment. Um, or it can be more subtle. Another reason that we punish is the punishment itself can be profitable. The criminal justice system exists to punish. Private groups can use this existence to make money. They can make it by prison labor. They can make it by incarceration. And this is something we'll address or, or, or more, and it goes beyond things like private prison. Um, punishment can allow us to separate groups from society. One of the things that psychologists are well aware of is the idea of the other. If you can claim someone is outside of your community is an other, it is so much easier for you to punish that person, to ostracize that person, to limit that person's rights, for good or for bad. So punishment allows us to say, well, look, they're different. They don't have your rights or they don't have your privileges because they're bad. And they're bad because we punish them. Um, of course, I'm going to include this slide. Sometimes you have to kill the elephant to teach them a lesson. In 1916, there was an elephant in Tennessee that, um, probably because it was being beaten, killed its trainer. So the good people of Irwin, Tennessee decided, well, we can't have that. We're going to hang the elephant, which is a very strange phrase, hang the elephant. And believe it or not, this is an actual picture of them. They brought in a railroad car with a crane on it and tied a chain to it. And they wrapped it around the elephant's neck and they hung it. Now, the reason I include this is I'm hoping this image is going to stick in your mind. It's one of the reasons I use, hopefully, um, examples like Hanging the Elephant or the Judge Roy Bean uh, reference, is this is obviously perfect deterrent. This elephant will never kill anybody again. Um, it's perfect specific deterrence. I don't think it's perfect general deterrence because I don't think elephants really are aware they're going to be hung if they mess up. Um, but... You can, in the back of your mind, as you're trying to say, well, you know, what is the point? 
you can look at this punishment. What was the point? And obviously a lot of people had to agree that hanging this elephant was a good idea. It wasn't just one guy who said, hey, hey, Bob, you know, I got an idea. Let's go hang this elephant. There had to be dozens, if not hundreds of people that cooperated in this because something in them said this was appropriate punishment. Okay, what is the dominant punishment? Well, our dominant punishment in America is incarceration. And this is probably the dominant punishment across the planet now. And that's something new to the modern age. If we went back a couple hundred years, I think that wouldn't be as true. So we're going to lock people up. Well, the first question that should come to our minds, if we're going to lock people up, if we're going to incarcerate them, how long should they be in? Should they get a sentence which is determinate, which is, okay, here is your sentence. You're going to get six months. You're going to get a year. You're going to get five years. You're going to get 10 years. And should that be set if he's convicted? Or are you going to have an indeterminate sentence where someone who gets convicted may get a maximum or a minimum amount of time and it may be active or it may not be active, it may be suspended, and we're going to leave those decisions up to the judges in some cases or the prison administration. So the, the system has to make an election. Now I will say that lately, in the last 50 years in the United States, we have moved closer and closer to a determinate system where the sentence is fixed upon conviction. Now there's some wiggle room there and I'm going to talk about that when we look at the North Carolina Structured Sentencing Act, but um, we pretty much have moved towards the determinate sentencing. Now there is, uh, uh, as I said, a little wiggle room here. We, we do have a mechanism to control people in prison because this is a major issue. If you throw someone in jail or prison and you say, no matter how you behave, you try to reform yourself, you're a good person, you, you know, try to get your GED, you're going to serve two years, period, end story. Well, then the question becomes, how do you control that person in prison? You can control him, I suppose, with the stick. You can give him additional time somehow. But if he's got a set sentence with no way out, he's difficult to control. On the other hand, if you can give him what we call in America good time, behave yourself, you won't serve six months, you'll serve four then you have an incentive in prison not to assault guards, um, not to cause riots, not to misbehave, to obey orders. Um, you also will hear the term truth in sentencing, and this is typically in place in most jurisdictions and it mandates that you serve a minimum part of your sentence, usually 85%. This truth in sentencing and the gradual rise of the terminant have led to, has led to very long sentences and very crowded prisons. All right. Um, one of the things about sentencing is the judge typically, and this particularly in the past, had a lot more authority. Now, in the past, we trusted a judge to look at the offense and say, okay, I'm going to take a bunch of things into consideration. How old the victim is, how, uh, what gender the, the defendant is. Uh, what is his economic opportunities, what his life has been like, and I'm going to craft an individualized punishment for him. Gradually, however, the state legislatures across the United States and the Congress of the United States adopted a different approach. This was very politically popular. This is the kind of get tough approach. So there was, uh, this was often seen as, well, you know, I heard about this guy who you know, killed someone and got off with nothing. And it's kind of the anecdotal reaction. Um, to make another movie reference, you have uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest with Jack Nicholson. And in that movie, Jack Nicholson, who has committed crimes, is sent to a mental institution under the belief that all he has to do is, you know, avoid his real punishment by getting sent to the loony bin for a while, and then he was going to get out. Um, and people reacted by accepting the idea um, in popular culture that, oh yeah, criminals are just avoiding punishment by using the, the dodge of insanity or mental illness. And we restricted this from happening. 
did it was it really happening on a wide scale? No. Did the public and hence their elected officials start to believe and act on it? Sure they did. Okay, um, some options that we look for sentencing. Very common uh, is fines and court costs. Uh, this is a wonderful way, the government believes, and to tax people. We don't call it a tax, but people that get a court fine, people that have to pay court costs, they can't complain by saying, well, you know, court costs are too high. Who's going to listen to them? We don't pay any attention to someone convicted. So you can tell them that they have to pay an amount of money and you can use that money to generate income. Um, classically, uh, and I think this is one of the root causes of the problems we saw in Ferguson, the small cities and towns in Missouri surrounding Ferguson were getting sometimes 40, 50, 60 percent of their budget out of fines and court costs. Besides fines and court costs, uh, we have probation. This is the most common sentence you get because most crimes are relatively minor. So mostly what you're going to get is you're not going to wind up going to jail or prison. You're going to be put on probation. The kind of standard one for the most serious crimes or more serious crimes is incarceration, actually sending you to prison and or jail. And there's a distinction between those two terms. Rarely, uh, but certainly a possibility in the United States, we have death. We have capital punishment. There are sometimes unique other options. There's a few states, uh, statutes that still have some corporal punishment options and things like that, but they're pretty freakishly rare, and I don't think they need concern us that much. Um, one of the things I'd like to talk about for you, and I just mentioned this, and this will be in the next micro lecture, is about court costs and taxes. Um, most stories about Ferguson, Missouri, focus on the racial issues of white officers and black suspects about systemic racism. But I want to focus in this on court costs and fines and what role they play in our criminal justice system and how they can exacerbate the problems we see. So if you're interested in that, that's going to be micro lecture 9.2. Lecture 9 uh, and it be five or ten minutes or so, just to give you a, a taste of it. Okay, if someone is convicted uh, of a serious crime, very often what is prepared is a PIR, pre-sentence investigation report. Now it can be called PIR, it can be called uh, PSIs, it can be called a ton of things, but pre-sentence before the judge decides what happens investigation report and in that title is an explanation of what it is. Very often a probation officer attached in some way to the court will be charged with investigating the individual. So he's going to get information for the judge. He's going to say, okay, you know, these things may not have come up at trial, but they might be important in you making certain decisions. Here is his past criminal record or here is his past service record. Uh, so you might have someone where the judge didn't know that this individual had three previous convictions for burglary and six for beating his wife. Uh, you also might have someone that they're, they've been arrested and instead their, their service record said, well, here's someone that served honorably in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and uh, was wounded and, um, you know, suffered PTSD and all these other issues might come up. The other thing um, is, of course, we're, we're going to find out things like, what's their employment? Do they have jobs? Are people reliant upon them? Um, do they have mental health issues? Do they have addiction issues? Now, for very minor crimes, you get arrested for jaywalking. This is not going to happen. You get arrested for assault with a day of the weapon. You get arrested for um, homicide and convicted. You're going to see a pre-sentence investigation report. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the role of the jury here. Um, the jury doesn't know the law. The jury is um, only supposed to make determinations of fact, which really means a lot of the law has to, if the 
they are going to make a, a decision which kind of impinges on this area of what the law is or isn't, you're really going to have to be guided there. Um, juries often have the option then of choosing to convict the defendant, and then there's going to be options prevented there. So if an individual is convicted of a murder, um, so let's let's take the example, and again, I'm sorry if this is um, uh, dated by the time you listen to this, but let's take the example of Mr. Floyd up in Minneapolis who um, died when a police officer kneeled on his neck and three officers uh, were with him. So there's four officers in total. I'm going to assume there's going to be a trial and the jury is going to be instructed by the judge that they can find him guilty of one of a number of offenses. Now, in North Carolina, um, they would have four basic options, um, three of which would probably apply here. First degree murder, second degree murder, voluntary manslaughter, and the fourth one would be involuntary manslaughter. And what would happen is the judge would read what the conditions or the elements of each one of those were, and then let the jury decide if it was proved. Um, in capital cases, if you are facing the death penalty, the jury, and only the jury, with the exception of Alabama, has the exclusive power to determine should the individual be executed. So the judge will tell them in North Carolina, okay, if you convict him, it's going to be up to you to determine if we kill him or if he gets life without parole. So what impacts the sentence that is typically handed down? Well, the first thing, and this is pretty self-explanatory, is how serious was the crime? So if it's a very minor crime like speeding, um, obviously sentencing is going to be light in most cases. If it's a very serious, serious crime, such as rape, um, you're going to see a longer sentence. Um, we also look at, even if it's kind of the same crime, was did something go on in that that would make it worse than normal? Now, we call these aggravating circumstances. San, 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 <laughs> aggravating circumstances. For example, if you are convicted of assault inflicting serious injury, um, but your victim was a child under the age of 10, That'd be an aggravating factor. If you were convicted of um, kidnapping, and during the kidnapping you committed a rape or an assault on the victim, that would be an aggravating factor. In fact, in North Carolina, it would for a separate charge. We also can have, though, mitigating factors, where the defendant, the person convicted ultimately, um, did something that made the crime less severe. So they might have cooperated with the police, uh, confessing to the crime or providing evidence against others. Or it might have been, taking our kidnapping example, it might have been someone who um, released the suspect in a safe place or protected them from others. The final thing that can impact sentencing is what is the judge's personal philosophy? How does he think about the law? You, in the 30 odd years I practiced, you're going to have some judges you're going to meet that they're going to be lock them up and throw away the key type. Um, so we had a, a judge in North Carolina where I practice, uh, Judge Renfer, who was very strict. Uh, if you wound up in front of Judge Renfer, you could pretty much count on a lengthy sentence. On the other hand, you would have some judges um, that were interested more in rehabilitation, particularly of children. So there was a judge we used to have here in Wake County called Jerry Leonard, who would spend a tremendous amount of time if a juvenile came in front of you, in front of him, and he thought that he could be helped in some way. So there are some judges that are interested in punishment. There are some judges that are more interested in rehabilitation. Now, structured sentencing. This is going to be departing a little bit from your text. Um, so just be prepared that if you're using the, your textbook here as your guide, we're really going to be stepping outside of it quite a bit, although it's going to relate to the concepts we're talking. 
So in uh, the 1980s, shortly after I started practicing, North Carolina began to adopt a structured sentencing format <clears throat> for punishment. What we did in North Carolina is we created a matrix or a grid. And on this matrix, and we're going to see an example of it in just a bit, uh, we're going to see the offense and we're going to see punishments. So offenses in North Carolina are classified as either a class A felony, B1, B2, it goes all the way down C, D, E, F, G, H, I is the lowest level felony you can get. And your punishment level is a Roman numeral. So the lowest would be a Roman numeral one up to the highest, which is Roman numeral five. We also include aggravating and mitigating circumstances. So this might seem pretty confusing if you're just looking at the slide, but voila, here is a North Carolina structured sentencing grid. So if you can follow the arrow that should be appearing on your screen there, you can see that here is your offense class. So we start with A, which there's realistically only one class A felony in North Carolina that you're ever going to see prosecuted. It's first degree murder. Down to B1, B2. And these are the serious crimes like uh, uh, rape, uh, first degree kidnapping, and then C, D, E, F, G, H, I. And I would be the, the least serious felony you could possibly think of. Very minor, minor crimes. Um, Across here, funny, uh, you have your prior record level, and this is if you have a Roman number one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, and you'll notice that there's these little things called points in here, zero to four, and, or zero to two, and two to four. And that means there's a way to arrive at a score in North Carolina about your previous convictions. If you have no previous convictions whatsoever, you are a level one. If you have multiple serious, pre uh, serious previous convictions, you're going to be a higher level. You could be all the way up to a six. And you will notice that if we go to the bottom of the chart, the least, the lowest numbers you see here would be a class I felony um, with no prior record level. And you would, you could see here at the very bottom where this arrow is bouncing, four two six four dash six. What that's going to mean is that in North Carolina, with no previous convictions, your sentence is already determined between four and six months. And this is your presumptive range. You'll also notice on this chart that there are A's, there are I's, and there are C's. And these all mean either active time, which means you're going to prison, I, which is intermediate time, which means you're, you could avoid prison, but you might get some prison. Or C, which means it's community service, period. You're not going to get it. So I'm going to go over this a little bit more in, in, in Micro Lecture 9.3. I'm going to show you the chart a little bit closer up. I'm also going to talk about how North Carolina has some aggravating and mitigating and has the three options of either active time, community time, suspended time. Okay, now we have to acknowledge that sometimes sentences are not the same. So this is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but we can talk about it in this way. There is sentencing disparity and there is sentencing discrimination. Um, sentencing disparity means those convicted of a same or similar crime get different sentences. Um, so this can be good or bad. I mean, if you think about, um, think about this scenario, let's suppose John Doe goes into a liquor store, sticking up the clerk, and then just to see if the gun works, shoots and kills the clerk and steals the money in the register. He does this in cold blood with premeditation, while he's completely sober, just for the profit and the enjoyment of killing. That's a first degree murder charge in North Carolina. Now contrast that with this charge. Let's suppose that Jane Doe is married and her spouse is suffering an incurable painful disease. And she assists her spouse in ending her life. In North Carolina, 
that is first degree murder. That is an assisted suicide in North Carolina is a first degree murder charge. However, do you think that a difference in sentencing between John Doe who shoots the liquor clerk and Jane Doe who tries to put her, her spouse out of pain should have the same penalty? And I think you, you honestly could say, if you ask that question, unless you're unusual, uh, yes, there should be a difference. So how is, or where do these different things come from? Well, they can come from the nature of the crime. But where we get a little bit more suspicious, and I think where there's more legitimate criticism of this, is when there are different sentences because of gender, race, or economic class. Um, so, three types of disparity we see. Similar sentences for crimes are very different. I commit jaywalking, I get the death penalty. You, you commit murder, and you get the death penalty. Well, we both got the death penalty, but the crimes are so different, you have to ask why. You can also say you get different sentences with the same crime. I commit jaywalking, you commit jaywalking, you get a fine, I get executed. Um, and usually what this means is some aggravating or some mitigating factors are having too much of an impact on the sentencing itself. Something is impacting the length of incarceration or, in the extreme, uh, the sentence of death. So, some groups are clearly punished at harsher levels. And one of these, and we don't tend to think about it, is gender. Men, in, as opposed to women, get disproportionately longer sentences. Um, the poor tend to get harsher sentences. Minorities tend to get harsher sentences. Some groups get well get uh, lighter sentences. Women, and this is a well-documented, it's called the chivalry effect, can commit the same crime as a man and typically will get less time. Uh, the wealthy also tend to get lighter sentences. Now, there is uh, a conflict here between the idea that the judge is best to decide what the penalty should be or the legislature. Who do you trust? So you have to ask yourself as you're studying this, um, what is the best system? Is the best system based upon what a group of men um, who don't know the specific crime have debated, debated in the abstract or is it the individual in the courtroom who has observed the crime, um, but is by himself or herself, and is making the determination of guilt and punishment? So which of those would you think would be more subject to prejudice or improper influence? Um, should we trust judges or elected officials to rep reflect our values and to understand what is right? So most states... Um, it's getting close to 30, so about 60%. Um, okay, 56% if you want to be specific. 56% or 28 states, including North Carolina, have some types of guidelines. The federal, gu the federal guidelines are particularly harsh. Um, so it can be very difficult for a judge to go outside these guidelines. In many ways, judges have lost in, in those jurisdictions, including North Carolina. A tremendous amount of power. Whereas previously it was really up to them what the sentence was going to be. Now the legislature has made that decision. So it can be very difficult, if not impossible in many cases, for a judge, even if he thinks, you know, this punishment is either makes no sense, it's too lenient, or this punishment is too harsh, he can't depart from the guidelines. Um, one of the things that's been going on is a reaction against mandatory minimums. In the 1980s and 1990s, we had a, a movement in this country to increase punishment. We saw massive increase in sentences, and we saw the adoption of very popular things like three strikes or outlaws and habitual offender laws. And the result of this is that jail and prison populations soared through the 1980s and 1990s. 
And we also begin to incarcerate tremendous numbers of nonviolent offenders. Now, lately, in part as a cost-saving mechanism and for a number of different reasons, the states and the federal governments have re-examined this and are questioning the wisdom of these mandatory sentencing. I don't know if this is going to be a return to the older judge-centered sentencing uh, or whether there's going to be some compromise, but increasingly the idea of things like three strikes you're out, um, which is basing your law off of a uh, sports metaphor, there has been serious questions whether it makes sense. One of the last things to talk about here is the victim. Um, if we go way back, um, the criminal justice system really used to focus on the victim. Um, the, the idea of the criminal justice system in many ways was to help the victim more than deal with the crime. So one of the old terms you would see sometimes is vergeld, W-E-R-E-G-E-L-D, which was blood money. So it was not uncommon in systems, both upon conviction or to avoid trial, where if my family had a family member that hurt your family, we would pay you. Uh, now, it might be in kind. We might give you sheep or we might have to give you land or gold, but we would pay you. And if the victim accepted this, uh, if the victim was okay with it, that was very important. So the, the victim was very much center of punishment. But gradually, we kind of pushed him aside. We wanted to have him testify. We wanted to have a victim. But we didn't want to give them a central role in determining outcome. This started to change in the 90s. One of the positive movements in the American criminal justice system, I think, was the idea that let's bring the victim back in. Um, so I'm going to talk here about VIS, victim impact statements. So let's take a, a horrific crime like murder. And let's suppose that someone is on trial for murder. And um, the difficulty there, of course, is there is no victim. Uh, he's dead. So you, you might look to and you might think about, well, there's other victims involved here that may have no knowledge of the crime, so they may not testify. Let's, let's suppose the victim's wife or the victim's husband. So you have a dead individual. You have uh, a defendant who's convicted of the homicide. Well, the wife wasn't, or the husband wasn't present at the murder, uh, did not offer testify as to the murder, but now is the time to let the judge know the impact of that murder on the family. So you would let the spouse uh, testify, you know, this is what happened. He was our only bread earner, or she was the glue that held the family together, or she was, you know, um, she was the sole caretaker of her mother, um, or, you know, he volunteered as a big brother. Uh, and you would inform the judge of what impact the crime had on the victims. And victim can be a, a broader term than simply the guy that got mugged. Um, it can be the people around him. And this allows the victim to play a central role. The judge hears these and can use them in part of the consideration to forge what punishment should be imposed. Now, there are pros and cons to this. One, as I said, it allows the victim and the community greater voice. Uh, two, it can be very therapeutic for the victim. It can allow them, often if they've been excluded from most of this, to finally tell the judge how they feel. It lets the judge and the jury see the larger consequences of the crime. And here's one that's overlooked, um, lest you think that, that victim impact statements just lead to longer sentences and, and more difficulties. It can be very critical in forgiveness or healing. The idea that the victim gets to say, this is my impact, now I'm done. Um, I feel like justice has been done. So it can be very critical in forgiveness. Here are some of the cons. Human beings are very emotional creatures, and victim impact statements can inject a lot of emotion into the process. And some of this emotion can be ugly. 
So it can allow prejudice and anger to become the central issues here. You can have people that are very good haters. And you also can have uh, something that's flipped there that wasn't really mentioned in your text. You can have unsympathetic victims. And, and if they seek to come forward and they seek to say, well, this is how it impacted me, it might be more dismissed. To, to use a very cruel and crude example, if you have a rape charge and the person raped takes the stand and she or he says, I'm a prostitute, sympathy might be lost for that victim. The nature of the crime might be more dismissed because the victim impact statement might have the opposite of the intent. So the final con is this does reinforce the concept of retribution, of punishment, punishment for punishment's sake. And it's questionable as to whether retribution is um, perhaps the wisest position we should take. All right, we're going to move on now on the time we have left primarily to talk about the, the death penalty. Now, there are, in the United States, five basic mechanisms left to end someone's life legally. Uh, electrocution, lethal gas, hanging, the fire squad. Um, I guess a firing squad is the proper, but a fire squad. Um, the, the firing squad is only available, by the way, I think in Utah, if I'm not mistaken. It's not a North Carolina methodology, so I don't know. Or North Carolina is in the most common lethal injection. Um, now, there has been a lot of contention about the death penalty. And one of the debates is about the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution, which says you cannot have cruel and unusual punishment. I want to emphasize that the Supreme Court has never, never ruled that by itself the death penalty is cruel and unusual punishment. However, in 1972, the Supreme Court of the United States briefly stopped all executions in the United States. They stopped them from the case of, because of the case of Furman v. Georgia. The Supreme Court justices looked at how the death penalty was being imposed, um, and you know some of the literature and briefs around it said it you know was freakishly irrational in its, in its imposition. Sometimes someone did something really bad and they didn't get the death penalty. Sometimes someone did something less less serious and did get the penalty, although typically both homicides. Um, it really required the states to go back to examine this and create a new system. In 1976, Georgia, which had lost the death penalty case in 72, came back with the case of Greg v. Georgia. And in that case, the Supreme Court said, okay, you can go back to executing people. Now, most modern challenges focus, lately at least, on the way in which we kill people, which is a little unusual, um, and not so much on the pure ethical nature, is it right to kill whatsoever. The... Um, if we look at death penalties by country and by state, the uh, first one there are those countries in 2019 that executed people. Number one, of course, is China. China executed a slightly more, more than a thousand. We don't know the exact numbers. The ones we have pretty good records on um, are Iran, uh, 251, Saudi Arabia, 184, Iraq, again, records a little spotty there, but we know it's more than 100. Egypt executed 32 people. United States, 22, Pakistan, 14, and Somalia, 12. You'll notice that there is no functioning liberal democracy there. Not a Canadian, not, not even a restrictive democracy. Um, they're all pretty much totalitarian states, with the exception of the United States. If we go over to this side, the United States and their execution since 76, and we look at who are the leaders, a had this chart in particular because I wanted to bring North Carolina in. Texas, unsurprisingly, is number one with 566. And of course, this is not reflective of population because the most populous state in the United States is California. And you'll notice it's nowhere on that list. Uh, and then for a lot of the time since 76, the second state or the third state now would be New York. And again, not on that list. Virginia, Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma is a bit of a surprise there, but Oklahoma has one of the most execution-happy jurisdictions I've ever seen. Florida, 
Missouri, Georgia, Alabama, Ohio, and then North Carolina with 43. Um, we're in the running, um, top 10, uh, tied with our brethren in South Carolina. And you will notice that there are some northern states, I guess you could argue. Ohio certainly is northern, uh, but the bulk of these are going to be southern states that still have executions on a large scale. How does the modern capital trial work in the United States? Well, we call it a bifurcated trial. Now, if you'll notice the way that that word is broken down, B-I means two. So it's a two-part trial. The first part is a determination, did someone commit the homicide? So you have to be found guilty to go to the second part. After you're convicted, um, the jury remains and a determination of what the proper punishment is. Now this means that different types of evidence gets presented, different perspective is there, and the jury can either vote for death or life imprisonment. If the jury can't decide if it's a hung jury on the second part, life sentence. Again, with the exception of Alabama, which allows the judge to impose it. Um, you can here are some limits that we have on the death penalty. And th these were put in place a bit at a time. One, you can't execute someone who is insane, either at the time they committed the offense or at their time of trial. Two, you can't execute someone who suffers from severe mental retardation. So the, the standard, if we use IQ, and it's a terrible measurement, um, if the standard IQ in a race runs between 85 and 115, we'll say 100 is the average IQ. If you had someone with an IQ of 65 or 60, um, you would not be able to execute them. You cannot execute someone who is under the age of 18 when they committed the crime or at trial. And pretty much the only offense you can execute someone for is homicide. You can't execute someone for rape or murder or burglary. I can't do it. North Carolina and the Supreme Court won't let you. So the debate about the death penalty is ongoing. So uh, let's, let's look at some evidence. Um, this first one is a bit of a surprise to my students most of the time, because I hear people say, well, why are we keeping it alive? It costs a lot of money. Well, the death penalty is more expensive. Um, in study after study we've done, um, we know now that if you're going to have the, the death penalty, it's going to cost you around $700,000 more to try, handle appeals, go through uh, the, the, the entire process and execute someone. It's about $700,000 more. Two, is it a deterrence? Our best evidence says no. Now there is a slight degree of evidence in some studies, to be fair, that the death penalty may be a deterrent. Um, it doesn't seem a very strong one if it exists. The third question, will innocent people be executed? Yes, there's just really no question about this. Since no man-made system can be perfect, since man himself is not perfect, then we're gonna make a mistake at some point and an innocent person is gonna be executed or certainly a person that isn't deserving of death. Is it arbitrary? Um, and again, I'm afraid the answer here is yes. Um, it's clear that you can have some people that are real monsters. Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer pops to mind. Jeffrey Dahmer was a serial killer who um, kidnapped, uh, killed, and cannibalized people. Um, he did not get the death penalty. But then again, you can have a person who commits a single offense. Um, uh, sometimes even a very young child. George Stenney pops to mind, the youngest person executed in the 20th century. Uh, who I believe was 14, and he was executed in the United States. So sometimes very heinous killers can escape, and less serious offenders will not. Um, does it discriminate? Yes. Um, there is a built-in discrimination against those that are poor, those that are male, and those that are members of minorities. They will simply have higher conviction rates and higher execution rates. So what's the best argument for it? I think the the best argument remains retribution. If you're going to support it, I don't think you can defend it based upon deterrence. I think you have to base it upon the idea that 
Uh, if human life is priceless, then the only way you can atone for it is by losing your own life. I think the other arguments tend to fail, but this is up to you. Um, this is something you have to ask. Now, just because I say that's the best argument for it, it doesn't mean that it's right. You could say, well, if that's your best argument, then we can't have it. Or what about this? What about this? What about this? I think those are all smart things to talk about. What's the future of this? Well, overall, executions have fallen dramatically. Um, and it's kind of a strange reason. We have shifted in the United States to executing people by lethal injection. But like a lot of things, as we found out during the uh, COVID-19 epidemic, there's lots of things that aren't made in the United States anymore. Not just um, masks and respiratory masks, but there is a number of drugs or chemicals uh, that are made outside the United States and not made internally. A couple of these are the ones necessary for our standard way in which we conduct executions. As I recall, the two primary producers of these that are imported in the United States are Denmark and Italy. Neither of those countries have this death penalty, and neither of those countries will allow the exportation of those drugs to the United States to be used for execution. What that means is we can't get the drugs to kill people. So if you're going to have the death penalty, you are going to have to go back to things like hangings or firing squads. Um, also, if we look at the public opinion, um, it's split. Although for the first time, certainly in my lifetime, this is November of 2019 now, um, a majority of the population now favors life sentence over capital punishment. So capital punishment has enjoyed fairly robust support. But if the alternative offered is life without parole, uh, really for the first time, the majority of Americans think that that's a better option. Still, this is something you have to fight about. You have to make a determination. And I think more importantly, you have to think about what do you want? Let's go back to that original question. What is the point of punishment and how does capital punishment fit into this? All right. On that note, we've come in, in a, about under an hour. Um, there's a couple micro lectures for you to look at. Other than that, I will be talking to you in Chapter 10.